Hello, I'm Dr. Danielle Pollock. Today we'll be talking with Associate Professor Zachary Mon about scoping reviews. Thank you for joining us today, Zach. My pleasure. Um, scoping reviews are becoming very, very popular within evidence synthesis. But why would we do a scoping review over a systematic review? Well, that's a really good question, Danielle. And you're right, scoping reviews are becoming increasingly popular. They seem to be the hot evidence synthesis approach at the moment. Uh, and a lot of people are trying to do scoping reviews. And I think that's because in the past, they've tried to fit different types of questions within a systematic review framework, and it hasn't quite worked. So scoping reviews are an alternative to systematic reviews but we don't conduct them for the same purposes. So when we conduct a systematic review, we, we often do it to identify the effectiveness of a treatment, for example, or we might be doing it to evaluate the diagnostic test accuracy of a, of a test, or look at the uh, prognostic factors or prognostic models, and so on and so on. Scoping reviews, on the other hand, are a little broader than systematic reviews. And although we have questions uh, as well which guide scoping reviews, they're not the same types of questions as we would use for systematic reviews. So we might do a scoping review to say identify the available evidence in a field or to, uh, to, to um, clarify or map key concepts in a field as well. So there are different types of questions and the scoping review results are normally used to inform uh, clinical guidelines or policy and practice in the same way that a systematic review is. You say that they shouldn't be used to uh, inform policy and practice. Can you tell me why? So you don't normally uh, ask a focused question like again like, like the effectiveness of a particular treatment. They're normally a little bit broader. So they can still inform policy and practice but they're, they're, they're different types of questions. Uh, and because scoping reviews normally have a broader remit uh, to, to map the evidence, to identify literature in the field, to see how research has been conducted, um, to identify or clarify key concepts related to a characteristic, etc., etc., uh, you have these broad questions and you don't normally go down a process of critical appraisal or risk of bias assessment. And because we aren't doing some sort of check of the validity of a research, uh, then they're not really appropriate to create recommendations to guide decision making um, uh, or, or drive care um, at, the, at the bedside as well. So, so once again, they're, they're a different, uh, different approach uh, done for different indications compared to systematic reviews. Now we do see some scoping reviews have used a critical appraisal method. Yes. Are they inherently wrong? Well, I mean, I don't think they're inherently wrong. It's, uh, there may be, may be in some uh, edge cases or, 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 or um, rare scenarios where critical appraisal may be useful. But once again, we're not normally doing scoping reviews to, to identify, say, the feasibility, appropriateness, meaningfulness, or effectiveness of a treatment to, to inform that sort of recommendation development. Um, they're normally done for, for broader reasons. So it's hard to... It's hard to see why you might actually do critical appraisal or risk of bias in a scoping review uh, because that's not normally, normally the purpose. Now JBI have developed some guidance on how to do scoping reviews. Yes. Can you just tell me a bit about that? Sure. So uh, there's um, scoping reviews, as, as I've mentioned, are uh, increasingly popular. Uh, the seminal paper in the field was by Arsky and O'Malley, who provided this, the first initial guidance and framework for conducting scoping reviews. Uh, this was built upon by Levac and Colquhoun later on. Uh, but there were still a lot of questions and perhaps uh, scoping review authors um, still had some questions and uncertainties about how to proceed. So uh, I think in around 2012, 2013, there was a group at JBI who, who got together to try to look at scoping reviews and try to come up with some formal step-by-step -step methodological guidance for scoping reviews. 
Um, now, as scoping reviews methods have evolved over time, a lot more people are doing scoping reviews now, and there's been some fantastic research that has investigated the conduct of scoping reviews. Uh, we have a lot more information about how they should be done, when they should be done, for what purposes as well. And all of this has culminated in our 2020 guidance for scoping reviews now, um, which has been recently published in the JBI Manual for Evidence Synthesis. So yes, the, the, the JBI and, and our collaborators um, have created these, these, these methods and, and um, really it provides step-by-step -step guidance for conducting scoping reviews. Now I've been reading a lot of scoping reviews. Uh, I notice a lot of the times that they'll use uh, Arxi and O'Malley and they'll may, maybe also use JBI guidance. So this mixing of frameworks, what are your thoughts on that? So, so I, I, I think it's always useful to refer to the seminal paper in the field and that initial guidance. And the JBI guidance has certainly built upon um, these previous frameworks as well. So, so we're standing on the shoulders of, of giants here. We, we didn't, we didn't um, um, start from scratch. Um, we used that guidance and, and then built, built upon it. And obviously as the fields evolved and more people have done scoping reviews, um, we've been able to provide more step-by-step -step guidance and concrete guidance on, on what were some of the I guess um, areas perhaps left out of the initial guidance or, or just where there still needed to be some development. So you can, I, I think you're sort of one-stop shop or one-stop resource now for at least methodological guidance uh, is the JBI handbook um, or manual for evidence synthesis and the scoping review chapter. And this is for methodological guidance. Uh, in terms of uh, how scoping reviews should be reported, there is an extension to a PRISMA statement, uh, which is uh, PRISMA Scoping Reviews or PRISMA SER. So uh, that goes hand in hand with the JBI guidance. So we've got JBI have the methodological guidance and the PRISMA SER um, gives people information about how you can report a scoping review uh, when, you, when you finish a review and are looking, for, uh, looking to publish it. Now we've also heard that there sometimes are some challenges with scoping reviews and editors. What are the challenges that you're seeing when it comes to actually publishing a scope and review? Yeah, so that's that's a really good, really good question. So there are some challenges and, and issues with conducting scope and reviews. I think one of the challenges are that people don't always understand why you should be doing a scope and review, and we've, we've had a bit of a chat about that um, today. Uh, it's, it's scope and reviews are done for different purposes, and they are a valid approach to evidence synthesis. But they shouldn't be seen as a way to take shortcuts when you are trying to answer a question of effectiveness or diagnostic test accuracy or prognosis, etc. Um, they are an alternative. So when you see scoping reviews which have been done, which claim to, to address a question about interventions or, or the effectiveness of interventions, then that starts to ring a few alarm bells. Uh, and it may show that people might be using scoping reviews um, to answer questions that, that a different method should, should be done, so editors can be a little bit worried about this. Uh, sometimes people, people are worried that scoping reviews aren't going to be systematic as well, and that you know, it's just this bit of a go and look and see and, and find, find out what's out there and, and then report it back, but uh, in the JBI guidance at least, we've tried to clearly show and state that scoping reviews are still a systematic process. They still need to have a protocol, they still need to follow a step-by-step -step approach, uh, and they still need to be very rigorous and transparent in their development as well. So editors uh, or, or, or authors or others, um, there may be some misconceptions, I think, about scoping reviews, which is, which is why um, sometimes there are some challenges. One of the other major issues that we often hear about from our reviewers and scoping reviews is they don't know how to analyse the material that they've mm -hmm. and the evidence. Yes. yes. So, what do you think is the best approach when it comes to data analysis in scoping reviews? Well, that's a really that's a really good question as well. So, this is one of the areas where we've tried to provide more more guidance and provide a lot of examples in the recent recent JBI chapter. Uh, and it depends a little bit about what your purposes are as well. So if you're just trying to identify what, what evidence is out there, then there are a lot of useful evidence map technologies now where you can actually create these maps of the evidence and show, show what, um, what questions have been answered and how the studies were done and perhaps what regions of the world and then present them on some sort of, some sort of map. If you're looking at, say, um, trying to uh, 
clarify a key concept to look at how people have um, um, defined key concepts and the differences between these uh, in, in studies published uh, internationally, uh, then you might need to use a different approach. You might need to um, use a, a much more textual approach, let's say, to try to do your analysis. I think the key thing to remember is, once again, we're not trying to do a meta-analysis or a, uh, a meta-synthesis in scoping reviews because, uh, once again, we're not doing that. We're doing it for broader reasons. We're not trying to find a single estimate to inform a policy or practice. We're trying to provide a, an overview of the literature in a particular field normally. So we're trying to avoid the traditional thematic analysis that may be commonly used in scoping reviews that we've seen and we'll go towards a direction of categorising that textual information? Well, that's depending on what your scoping review is, there may be um, some sort of coding and categorisation needed just to help you sort sort through and then present the data in a, in a meaningful, meaningful way, especially because some scoping reviews, because they can be broad, can have huge data sets that they're, that mm. they're evaluating. So sometimes some sort of um, basic coding or categorisation can be useful. So what resources should uh, a reviewer who's interested in doing scoping reviews access? Right, well if you're starting, if you're starting from, from, from scratch, if you're a novice and you don't have a lot of information, I do think the JBI chapter on scoping reviews, which is in the JBI Manual for Evidence Synthesis, is, is the best place to start uh, because we really do provide that step-by-step -step guidance. Next, uh, I mentioned the Prisma SER, uh, the Prisma Scoping Review Extension. Make sure you are checking this. It's, 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 it's very useful to guide how you should be doing your scoping review report. There are now training, training courses on scoping reviews as well. At JBI, we have some training courses uh, and there are some uh, webinars on scoping review conduct as well. And the other thing is I think you should um, try to find some colleagues who have some background in evidence synthesis and particularly talk to uh, an information scientist or librarian um, to help you with your searching as well, um, which is very important to get right. Yeah, and you can join our Scoping Reviews Network. Of course, of course, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, so yes, JBI have a Scoping Reviews Network with, a um, with uh, newsletters and, and points out to resources as well. Thanks for your time today, uh, Associate Professor Zach Bunn. Thank you, Danielle. It's been my pleasure.